We are in a very unromantic movement in American history. Racism, anti-immigrant hysteria, nativism is just... I'll do anything short of shooting them. Enough is enough. Friends, how are you doing today? I hope you're all safe wherever you are. In today's world, it has become important to ask if you're feeling safe today. There's so much going on in the world. And um, yeah, we are going through elections here in the United States. And today I'm here to talk to you about something that's heavily discussed in our elections. And no, it's not about COVID-19 and it's uh, not, not, nothing about the political parties or it's nothing about the election by itself. But it's about a very important topic that, that has remained a hot topic for many, many years now in different countries and different political parties and every society. Uh, something that has polarizing views across different uh, political spectrums. And this is about immigration. It's about people like us, the immigrants. Uh, people who have left our motherlands and we have come here to the United States of America. I'm talking about all immigrants. I'm not talking about specifically one state or one country or one nationality or one religion or people speaking one language. No. We all come from different places. We all speak different languages. We all look different. We all sound different. We have different backgrounds and we have our own challenges and we've come here for our own reasons as well. So no two immigrants are alike. Uh... But what binds us is that we are here and uh, any policy that's affecting uh, the immigrant community affects all of us and uh, anything that we have to uh, think about and anything that poses a challenge to us affects all of us. It may not at the same time, but yes, eventually it gets to all of us. The United States is built by immigrants. And so this should be a very easy discussion to have, but unfortunately it is not. Let me tell you a story about something that happened 26 years ago. In 1994, a ballot initiative called a Proposition 187, Save Our State, was put out on the ballot in California. California was not what it is today. California back then was a very different California. Uh, Prop 187, that it was called in short, was designed to deny public services to immigrants living in the U.S. without documentation. So, the so-called illegal immigrants who were living here without any documentation, they had no access to public health care no elementary, middle and high school education and no public colleges and universities. So that was the aim of this new proposition, Prop 187, that was initiated. So the initiator, initiative also required uh, state and local agencies to report immigrants who did not meet the residency criteria to both state officials and federal immigration authorities. Can you imagine uh, school teachers reporting against students children who were suspected to be in the country illegally, suspected, mind you. I know some of you may not say anything wrong with it, while some of you will feel horrified by it. However, Californian voters approved the ballot. Yes, believe it or not, they approved the ballot. The Prop 187 was passed with a 59% vote. But it was never implemented uh, because legally they could not. The courts ruled that it was unconstitutional, so it never came into effect. Despite winning the ballot, to this day, to this day, Proposition 187 remains one of the most uh, divisive measures in the history of the United States, not to mention the California state history. And the battle over its passage ultimately reshaped California politics totally. It, it became a blueprint for anti-immigration laws across the U.S. and it, it awakened the Latino power, the Latino political power. It led to a whole new generation of uh, Hispanic politicians. 
uh, dramatically that changed the face of California politics. It was the major factor in making California what it is today, a progressive and democratic powerhouse. So now, uh, what I'm about to tell you is there's a new documentary film that has been made about that pivotal period in California's history. The film is called 187, The Rise of the Latino Vote. So KCET, a producer of award-winning and uh, diverse original content for public media with PBS Sokal, uh, have produced uh, this 90-minute film which premieres in Southern California on Tuesday, on October 6th. Uh, at 8 p.m. Pacific time on KCET. And it will also play on various channels on a few other times and days, which I'll be posting it here. I'll be sharing that information in this video. I got to watch the film, and it is really interesting in a, in a, in a sense that it goes into the minds of the people who were there and who participated in those events. You know, many of the activists of those days have now gone on to become political leaders. They, they hold some... Uh, position of influence now. So uh, to talk about Prop 487 and making of the film, I have with me the filmmakers themselves all the way from Tijuana in Mexico. Let's go meet Omar Foglio and Jose Luis Figueroa. All right, so I have here today with me Omar Foglio and Jose Luis Figueroa, uh, the Hi. writer and great, director. Great to meet with you. Uh, filmmakers of 187. Oh, thank you very much for sending me over the copy to watch. Um, my, the first question that came to my mind is, there is so much of data collected in that film. There is so much of footage, so many interviews with so many people who were there when Prop 187 was actually initiated. Uh, so when did you guys actually start? It must have taken a long time to uh, put all that together. So when did you actually start working on that project? We worked on this documentary for one year, uh, but really it was very tight no, for the amount of work uh, that needed to be done uh, under normal circumstances. I think it would take twice as much. Yeah, uh, and I think a lot of work in 12 months. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but the, the interesting thing is that um, for us it's, it's quite like a methodology to work in this historical kind of uh, documentaries is to approach the people who were involved uh, first hand with the issue. In this case, uh, the people uh, uh, who were uh, involved in the struggle for to try to defeat the the, um, the passage of uh, Proposition 187. And so we started interviewing informally with, with all these people and for us was like learning first hand their, their perspective and their, their, the, the, the information that they had. Um, and and that put us in a, in a position that to tell the story from their perspective. And that was our goal from the beginning. Uh, uh, Prop 187 is, is a topic that has been, uh, I mean, fully explained. And it's, it's, it's a lot of work around that uh, documentaries and news pieces and a lot of, uh, of um, writing material about it. But... Uh, what we tried to do was to tell the story from the, the, the perspective of the people who were involved, who were, uh, who were reacting to, to, to this situation. Uh, and, and that was like a, a kind of like a twist for the story. Um, so yeah, yeah, that, that, there's that, like a... That was my next question, Jose answered it for me. Uh, was was that you know if you just Google Prop 187, there are hundreds and hundreds of links that open up about it. So uh, did you at ever point, any point think that you know you might just be repeating something that's already out there? But after watching the film, I know that you have filled in a lot of the gaps that uh, you know that we commonly find. Um, it's 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 very interesting the way you have done it, and yes, I I especially wanted to. Uh, Omar, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, you were saying something. Oh no no no, it's uh, it's, it's fine. To, uh, but just picking up on what you just said, I mean yes, there is this uh, established, I would say established narrative around the story of what 187 was. Uh, but once we started uh, uh, speaking directly and meeting uh, people who became characters in our film. I mean, as Jose said, we started learning 
that, I mean, this history is much more complex. Uh, there's so much more uh, behind it. And, uh, but what was also important for us was not to not just learn or uh, I would say like uh, receive information, but also uh, uh, like the feeling or the sentiments that would come up when they would uh, explain things, things to us. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that's something we, as part of our process that we uh, uh, value a lot uh, because it's something that's not, you might not reason it, but it's something, something that uh, people transmit to you. And then it's something that we try to capture uh, in, our, uh, in the film as a whole. No? Yeah, yeah and, and yeah, it's also like the idea was to try to recreate like an experience for, from, from the perspective of these people. Like to, to talk about, for example, the, the big march, try to, to be able to be, be in the march with them. To, to recreate the experience. And all the archival material that we gather was um, a metaphor of the memory. In a way, it was a way to, to express or to, to remember from, from what it's uh, the, 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 the material part of that collective memory from the past. And it was this 90s television language like or a visual language from the from the tv of the 90s that came very, very obvious to use and that is why we we use the, the small tvs and and all the materials that it's uh it's it's, it's um low quality kind of uh, pixelated or rough kind of uh, material no like analog video you no know, and kind of like you as if you were just sapping or surfing on the television channels, no, yeah. and switching from one thing to another and kind of yeah. keep it fast pace, no. Yeah, well, one of the things that really stood out to me as we, as you we were watching it is the when they said that you know uh, the there were a lot of things going wrong in California at that time. There were there were the wildfires and the economy was not doing great, and uh, uh, but but the immigrants were made into a scapegoat. You know, immigrants became the scapegoat to all the problems going around, and uh, and and so. But but yes, once once you decided to protest the ballot, you had uh, a, a strong movement. A big procession came up, but still you managed. You uh, the the uh, but but the election was lost. You know, the the bill was passed. Uh, well, what, why do you think so? Because I, from what I saw, all the immigrants came together. You had the uh, African Americans, the Asian Americans, and uh, of course, the, all the, the Latin Americans, everybody came together. But still, the election was lost. Uh, and, uh, the court had to come in to uh, save it. But that's, that's a different story. That's history and how it happened. But uh, I would have liked to see the reason for that, the loss a little more. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that, that, I think like what happened with 187 was the, the, the ignition of a process. It was a moment when a, a big process of empowering the, the Latino community uh, itself uh, began in, in, a, in a concrete way because uh, prior to Prop 187, there were a lot of people who were eligible to vote or eligible to become U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were reluctant to do it. Um, we, di we didn't have time in the documentary to go deep in that. But for example, in conflict with the, their own citizenship, for example, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, Mexico government allowed the double citizenship for, for Mexican citizens. Oh, citizenship. Okay. That, was, that was something that came in play also oh. in the 90s. So people were more open to to become U.S. citizens because they they felt that they will not lose their own uh, Mexican citizenship. For example, that's an that's an example. So they did not want to ruffle anybody's feathers. Yeah. Yeah, and and it was a process of of uh, naturalizing naturalizing uh, new citizens, 
in place already when this happened. What, what happened was like this uh, coalition that was formed with around Prop 187 created the, all the, the network uh, to be able to include more people in that process. And I think the time was not exact, uh, perfect for that. Uh, the, the election was in place and, and, and they, they didn't have time to really enroll more people to be able to vote. That's why they took the streets because it was, was a moment where they were, it, that, that was the only way to express uh, their position against Prop 187 because they were not going to be able to do it in the, in the ballot. No? But also kind of things develop uh, in a, gradually, um, like the initiative uh, that eventually became Prop 187, I mean, it was originally called Save Our State Initiative. Save Our State. And it was started by a small group of activists in, in Orange County. Um, so um, from uh, based on what our uh, documentary characters explained to us, it was like rumors started to spread that there was a small group of activists in Orange County, you know, uh, uh, creating you know, uh, this initiative. And, and many thought it, would, would, it wasn't going to take off, you no. Know? And, 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 and for it to become a, a ballot measure, they needed like thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of signatures. So it, it felt like they were, weren't even going to make it, you know. Uh, but then um, that's when the uh, 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 election came, started coming close, and and the, the governor uh, Pete Wilson at the time, Republican governor Pete Wilson, uh, was at a disadvantage uh, looking yeah. up uh, to the 1994 elections. Uh, so when uh, his team, uh, they did, when they decided to uh, take on immigration as a, a wedge issue for their campaign, uh, then they they embraced you know, uh, the work that the small the small group of activists were doing, and they they pushed it, and that's how they managed uh, to get enough signatures. But they had they got. Uh, Many, many, like yeah. hundreds of thousands of signatures more than they needed. You know? uh, so for this, this happened between 1993 and 1994. So uh, we also are left with the sense that there was a lack of awareness among the Latino community uh, about what was happening. You know? um, and, and so again, mixed with the lack of uh, motivation to become a citizen. So if, if you're not considering uh, uh, becoming a citizen, imagine regi registering to vote. First, if you're not a citizen, you can't vote, but then a lot of people who were able to register to vote maybe weren't even motivated uh, uh, to do it, no? So there were a lot of factors, but the truth is when, when word started to spread about 187, even within the Latino community, the majority of Latinos uh, were willing to vote for it. So that, that was crazy. And a uh, large part of the work of the activists and, and people from the labor movement and, and everyone who, who uh, uh, reacted against it was to educate families from the Latino community about what this proposition meant and how it was going to affect them. And slowly when people started realizing what was going to happen, that's when the community got galvanized. And, and when the elections came, uh, part of the success of these activists was that the, the majority of Latinos voted against Proposition 180. Yeah. And so they managed uh, to vote against, and also the uh, Asian American community, the African American community. But more, still, more than half. Uh, more than half. But still, I mean, the the in overall majority of California voters approved 187. No, so it, it was passed in the 1994 elections. He has made tremendous progress over the last 25 years, but we still got a lot to do 
we should be very aware of the shortcomings that we've got. The Latino community in particular, as president and general counsel of MALDEF today, I know that our Latino community does not have the representation that it should have in leadership in the corporate sector, in the higher education sector, in the media sector. So we have challenges, not just for those of us in California today, but for those throughout the nation who are facing unprecedented levels of fear inspired by anti-immigrant lies and rhetoric. In terms of the national landscape, unfortunately, Prop 187 became the blueprint for um, really horrendous um, anti-Latino policy. On this vote, the yeas were 239, the nays were 182. The bill is agreed to. The bill is passed without objection. Hoy continuaron las manifestaciones en contra de la HR 4437. In downtown Los Angeles, Latino immigrants marching. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you both a very hypothetical question. If, 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 if that if that election were to be held now, uh, how do you think it would go? Well, in California, but, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, what it's interesting about the film is uh, all the the coincidence with with what is happening right now. Um, we were uh, that, that's a thesis of the documentary that we might be experiencing in the U.S. what what uh, these people experienced in California in the 90s, 1994. Um, for example, the, uh, the, the, this police brutality uh, issue that it's in debate right now was in, in debate at that moment with Rodney King yeah. beating with, by the police. It was a very uh, publicly known uh, event and it, 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 the, the reaction from the verdict of the, of the jury for in the trial of these officers that were involved in the beating of Rodney King, the reaction uh, ignited the, the LA riots, which is pretty, pretty similar of what we seen with uh, Floyd, no? George Floyd. George Floyd. So that's, that's a connection. That's something you see. Uh, we can say that, the, for example, the, all the, the, the earthquakes and fires that came and all the, the economy uh, problems that California had in the, in the 90s could be relevant or could be connected to, or you can, you can see a, a cycle in, in the problems that we are facing with the economy right now because of the pandemic, no? Uh, so... There is this these connections, no? It's 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 a different moment, but I, I mean, I I don't think a proposition like 187 would be approved of in California uh, today. Uh, but what's interesting is that um, 187, although it was uh, stopped and at court because it was considered unconstitutional, uh, and and it was unconstitutional. I mean, after that, after some years, you would start to see in other states of the United. States uh, uh, similar uh, law proposals, no. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like 187 became like a blueprint uh, for other states to uh, uh, work on similar Same their immigration laws and uh, yeah, yeah. I can I can, t I can totally see that happening. Uh, and looks looks like many of the states have continued in that direction. Uh, and now, the, now it appears that there's a very clear distinction between a sanctuary city and a not a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the same animus against uh, immigrants do continue here when, uh, when anything, anything goes wrong, be it with nature or be it with economics or be it with the industry or business, uh, the, the, the first, first blame is on the immigrants, mm -hmm. right? So uh, mm -hmm. immigrants continue to be the... A scapegoat for anything that's going wrong in the society um, and, and in, in a sense I mean that seems to be happening all over the world not just in the United States no, absolutely absolutely it's like an, an easy target it is the most it's like immigrants or undocumented people 
no matter what country they are in, it's like they're the most vulnerable because they, you, you don't have like the resources or even the rights, you know, to, to fight back or answer. So you tend to, to stay in the shadows, no? So it's an easy target that won't hit back mm-hmm. or it's very difficult, no, uh, as a group uh, to hit back. So mm-hmm. it's just unfair, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, what your film has accomplished is, uh, I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure you guys have realized it. Uh, is it, it not just highlights the prevailing period of those days, it also highlights how uh, it, it could be resolved, you know, how uh, different groups coming together and working together mm-hmm. can make their case stronger. Uh, be, because yes, we still have the law of the land very strongly in place. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, political powers, uh, uh, I hope, will not be able to hold sway over the law of the land. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we, we should be able to uh, use that as a model where different groups of people, it's not just uh, one certain ethnicity or uh, people of a certain nationality. It's like, uh, you know, when you see something that's unjust and unfair, it's like the entire group comes together and there's a larger support. And that's, that's when you see true, uh, true democracy in action. Yes, and, and it's, it's also an interesting moment because uh, the, the discussion about, about um, human rights were starting. Uh, it's, it, this discussion about human rights, uh, it's, not, it's not been there uh, for a long time. It's starting at a certain point and it's in the 90s where it's more more um, frequent that you start learning about that. Um, before that, it was more like a civil rights kind of uh, idea, no? And and what you see within these coalitions is more like start start to to uh, connect through the human rights, uh, and it's it's very present now. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't matter where you come from. It's, it's a matter of human rights. It's a matter of, of dignity. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the um, inspiring or the um, hope that, that at least I have in, in the possibility of that we can be connected through that, through something that is common to everybody. It doesn't matter where you come from. It's, it's uh, it's it's there are certain inherent rights just to be a, from being a human being, no? And and I think that's the beauty of the story that we were able, able to tell with the 187 documentary. Um, just all these coalitions that starting started to get built, no, and all across you know different uh, generations and uh, even social classes, and you know the Latino community is so diverse because. Uh, I mean, you can be from so many countries, you know, you, not just Mexico, but, you know, Guatemala, El Salvador. And then uh, there's, I mean, uh, like in Mexico, there's the Mexican community, but there's also indigenous communities. So in, in California at the time, uh, you would have like uh, the, the Chicano community, the first generation immigrant community, you no, know? and then the people from all these other countries and and the fact of the term Latino, no, and having all these different communities, you know, yes, you might be Guatemalan American, Salvadorian American, indigenous American, but also consider yourself Latino and come together, no, as a community and express your voice and come out and say, you know, what you feel towards this um, initiative, no, that's targeting you. I mean that's that's just beautiful, no? And and we we try to represent that uh, in the story um, because it's not it's usually it's not talked about, you know. Uh, there were student student walkouts, you no know, high school students and and mid school students that came out to the streets, you no, know, to spread their their voices. Uh, within the arts community, uh, we focused a bit on. Uh, this uh, theater group called uh, uh, Culture Clash uh, that at the time they, they had a television show that was aired in many parts of the, the U.S. It was a uh, comedy satire 
show, but I mean, these, but these guys were talking about the uh, issues about the immigrant community and sometimes directly, you know, uh, speaking about Pete Wilson and what was happening in California at the time. And, and also in, in visual arts, uh, we interviewed Lalo Alcaraz, who is the, the uh, cartoonist and author of La, the La, Ca La Cucaracha uh, comic strip. And, and he, he was just starting at the time. I know he came from, yeah, you know, doing zines and all, but he had just gotten a job at a more established publication, the LA Weekly. And every week he had, you know, a new uh, cartoon and he would, you know, draw Pete Wilson a, mm -hmm. a lot. No? And some of these images became emblematic and people sometimes would use them, you know, during marches, no? And also the, the Latino media, the Spanish speaking media also played a, a big role uh, in, in, in not just helping, you know, the community, but also educating the community on their rights, no, and what they could do uh, at the time, no. And then, and then music, no, uh, uh, there was, back in the 90s, that, that was like the beginning of the, what they call rock en español, uh, Spanish song rock music in, in the U.S., but it was also, uh, it was funny because it was also segregated. You had like established, you know, uh, uh, Chicano uh, rock bands, uh, one of the biggest is the Lobos. But you also had like the, the rock and Espanol uh, movement happening, but they were, they were like two scenes apart. And 187 uh, uh, created the circumstances for, you know, these youth communities uh, at some point to come mm -hmm. together no? and that was best expressed during a, a big rock festival that actually the, the, the folks from Culture Clash or helped organize and they had a, a great bill with Rage Against the Machine, Cypress Hill, some of the big alternative acts from the time but then they also had bands from Mexico from the Rock and Español movement like uh, Tijuana No and there were also um, Los Angeles-based bands that were part of the Rock and Español uh, movement, like Maria Fatal, there, and they also had some of the Chicano uh, bands. So, I mean, for a young kid to go to this festival and see these bands, you know, and 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 just you know celebrate together, you know, who you are, being Latinos and with the music, it was just uh, left a mark for a, a new generation of, of young people, no. Uh, that grew up with a different vision of what they could do and that they need to get involved. Mm -hmm. They need to become citizens. They need to register uh, to vote if they want to change uh, things. No? Absolutely. In fact, I, I found that very fascinating. The artists were involved and, and also uh, the, the, the theatrics. There was a lot of uh, self-deprecating humor. You know, uh, you, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I was seeing that the, the performers were... Um, actually enjoying the stereotyping which was happening at that point which is something very unique i've seen because in in the south asian community you know that's that's a huge um, bone of contention we have that you know that we are stereotyped in the in the mainstream so mm -hmm. that's that's one of the efforts is to kind of you know erase that stereotyping that that's happening but here it was refreshing to see that the, they were very actively uh, promoting their own stereotypes by uh, but, but still kind of giving the message <laughs> yeah that was that was very interesting to see yeah and, and it was that uh culture crash was the the evolution of the teatro campesino which was um uh, uh, a way like a political theater that came from the uh, uh farmers uh, yeah, the, chicano. the chicano movement uh in the 70s uh, mm -hmm. late 60s early 70s um and they they were they were the the next generation that came out from the Chicano movement. They were very very uh, um, aware of the satire as a way to to ignite dialogue and and to tease uh, to tease that uh, notions uh, uh, and and laughing about the the stereotypes. So that's that's interesting uh, to see that and this this coalition of 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 different generations and different. Uh, migrants from different parts of uh, Latin America and also in different people that came to the U.S. in different moments, uh, first generation, second generation of, of migrants uh, or even third generation of, of, of uh, US, U.S. citizens. Uh, 
came together. Uh, and and the, the moment that you see that in the film is the march. The march is it's a moment where you see all the coalition going to the street all together, not only the Latino community, but also, uh, as you were mentioning, the, the Asian American community, the, the African, -American. African American community, uh, hand in hand, walking in, in the streets. And, and it was by that time the, the, the biggest march that LA, in the LA history. It, it was huge. Uh, um, um, but what was incredible uh, about that moment, this was the march that happened on October 16, 1994. There have been a, uh, a couple more marches, but this just, the last, last march was like a few weeks before the election. And it just was, uh, as I mean, 75,000 people, huh? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, some talk about 100,000 people. So at the time, there hadn't been a march as big as that. But imagine this, a lot of the people who came out to march, I mean, these were entire families, and many were undocumented. So uh, having the courage of stepping out and putting yourself in a position, you know, people were afraid, afraid that there could be uh, raids, you know, um, uh, that the immigration authorities would would come up in the march and take people, uh, yeah. take people yeah. but but overcoming that and coming out you know and just to express even though a lot of those people weren't even going to vote in the uh, 1994 elections because it was not mm -hmm. possible for them uh just, just to come out was uh, like a big deal you know and to do it in a very dignified way i mean that speaks and very peace, highly peaceful. You know, and peaceful very, very peaceful yeah. march yeah. and yeah orderly and and also it was a surprise, the, the number surprised a lot of people. Uh, I, I, I read about like, uh, even the proponents were, proponents of 187 were surprised. Um, but the, the thing was like, all this organizing was on the street level and also in the Spanish, Spanish speaking media. Um, all the discussions were in Spanish and nobody was paying attention to what was mm -hmm going on uh, it was it was um, it was followed also by the LA Times and all the, the English speaking media but but not in that in the in depth and in the same um, way that the Spanish media were portraying the, the movement so it was a surprise because there was an an outlet uh, not necessarily accessible or invisible for for a lot of people but the, the conversation was happening and that, that's, that's, that's um, um, an in, in, interesting moment, no, for, for while, the movement. While you're on that topic, uh, I have to ask you this question because uh, my audience is uh, you know, primarily Indian and South Asian. So while, uh, while you were, um, you know, getting support from different quarters and everything, have you found uh, significant support from the South Asian community as well? Well, I mean, for... The movement against 187, yes, there was a, a, a very big uh, coalition you know, that also took place between the Asian American community, mm -hmm. as, as big and diverse as it is also, with the Latino community. And, and you can see uh, a, a bit of that on the film. We use some uh, photographs of the uh, different groups of, of the Asian community uh, mm -hmm. taking part in the march. But they also built their own organizations their own coalitions um and and they did a, a lot of activism not just uh you know registering people to vote uh phone banking also and just plain you know grassroots uh mm -hmm. organizing no uh, uh i mean the our, our story um uh is focused more on the latino uh community so yeah and it, it was because of the the wording of the proposition mm -hmm. uh was very um, I mean, it was it was targeted to any anyone who might have an accent or even get worse, as Nije Wataki stated in the film, people who didn't speak English even. You know? yeah. So so people who were in that in that in that situation that uh, who might create a suspicion from a, um, um, an authority or or a official from 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 the health department or from the school district 
might be uh, might be como se dice denunciar de, de, the, 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 they would be uh, suspects so, no? mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. so anyone with uh, brown skin dark skin anyone who might not speak English perfectly uh, is a suspect no was a suspect no yeah absolutely so mm -hmm. so one last question uh, yeah maybe one of the last questions is do you think now it has become um, uh, easier to become a, a legal immigrant or are there more ways one can become a legal uh, immigrant now as compared to then H have more doors opened to become legal now but what we learn is that prior to this moment in California 1994 uh, in the late late 80s there were uh, th there was this uh, huge law that came in, in place uh, the, the famous amnesty law that uh, basically signed it, yes. yeah uh, like paved the way for a lot of people who were already in the United States to become uh, uh, legal residents yeah. of the U.S. That's that was like a, a huge uh, huge collection of, of people from from Central America and from Mexico that. Uh, became legal residents and eventually became citizens uh, and all that. Uh, I don't see that now. Uh, I don't see that path now. It's, I think now it's really difficult to, to just to just to be in the U.S. is, is difficult for for someone who's migrating, um, even with a visa or whatever. It's, it's more difficult now. I, I think. I think and that it's more so, uh, more so for those coming from the southern borders. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and you see, you see more uh, like places like or like copycats of this law in in place still. No. And uh, there are places that you can be detained by the police and ask for uh, for your uh, legal uh, like resident or uh, immigration status. Uh, and that's that's um, that's. That that was the controversy for Prop 187. That uh, it's just a it's a federal um, it's in the, within the federal sphere, uh, legal sphere, just to 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 regulate immigration, not in the states or in the city levels uh, or county levels. So just to think about like a a, a police officer detained you just because your color because of your color of your skin or your accent, that's, that's, I don't, I, it's just very, yeah, it's terrible. I mean, yeah. it's really, yes, it is. Discriminatory. Okay, um, so, uh, now that this film is done and it's going to be premiered and, uh, uh, from what I've seen, you've done an awesome job and people are going to love it. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's going to go places, uh, but, uh, what next, what else is in the pipeline for you guys? Uh, yeah, well, we're, um, uh, I mean, the film premieres uh, Tuesday, October 6th yes, I don't, on, yeah. on KCET, and uh, it's also going to be available to watch online on uh, kct.org, yeah. on uh, the website, and, and it's also uh, will be shown in uh, many of the PBS stations uh, across the nation, so if uh, we encourage everyone to check their local listings on PBS to see if it's uh, when it's going to be shown, or, or if not, just uh, visit the KCT website. No, uh, starting I'll on. I'll be, uh, I'll be uh, sharing all those details. Uh, on oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but I mean, I mean, right now we're working on a couple more uh, documentary uh, films. Uh, uh, of course, it's been a challenging year because of the pandemic, so we had to reschedule uh, a few shootings that we had, but hopefully we're uh, uh, going to start doing them uh, this month and during November. And uh, one of the uh, uh, films that we're doing is a co-production with the Mexican Institute of Cinema, mm -hmm. and uh, it follows uh, uh, one uh, uh, craftsman uh, from Mexico, from a small uh, town in Mexico, in the state of Jalisco, who migrated to the U.S. and, and settled in Los Angeles uh, in the early 80s. 
And what we're exploring with him, once in the U.S., he became a very a brilliant uh, upholsterer. Oh, okay. Uh, so he's an artisan, uh, but he also has, uh, uh, but his passion uh, is horses. So he's, he's a horseman. Mm -hmm. But in, in the U.S., he's managed to uh, uh, be successful and establish a family and he has uh, uh, grown uh, sons and daughters. But he's managed to maintain uh, many of their traditions from their hometown to the point where uh, uh, his hometown has gone through a lot of uh, difficult times over the years and it's all, almost close to the verge of disappearing. But he has managed to organize with other families based in Los Angeles uh, who come from the same town uh, and to go back every year and set, have their big uh, celebration in December, uh, their patron saint celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been following him and his family during uh, their efforts to maintain their traditions and give, uh, bring life back to their uh, uh, home community. <laughs> Fascinating. That's one of the projects that we're working on we'll right now. To, uh, we'll definitely keep track of it. We'll check it out once it's out. That's wonderful. So uh, what message you. do you have for people to uh, now? Uh, what do you want people to take away after watching this film? What's your, what's your message after watching 187? What do you want them to think and what do, what do you want them to believe? Well, if, if you can vote, re uh, vote. If, you, if, if you're in time to register to vote, do it. Um, participate. I mean, uh, even, even if, if you're not necessarily, um, like, if you're not a, a U.S. citizen, you also can particip participate in, po political, in a political way. Uh, it's it's a, because it's, a, it's, it's um, uh, human rights, and and dignity it's it's uh, it's inherent to everybody everybody and we can we can have a voice and we can we can tell we can talk about it uh openly and i think that's that's important uh, and i think the lesson uh from from the people who who struggle with, with the Prop 187 is, is that uh, you can also organize and connect with other, uh, it doesn't matter if they're different than you, you, you can connect and you can work together. Uh, that, that would be my... Absolutely, very well yeah. said. This is, not a, this is not a question of nationality, this is more a question of humanity. Mm -hmm. so that's, okay. uh, yeah. And one thing that I found very inspiring uh, by doing this project is that um, if you speak with many of the uh, uh, people that we interviewed, uh, I mean, today they, some are California state senators, others were senators or, or were part of the assembly. Um, I mean, very prominent uh, people who have had a, a big impact uh, for California to be what it is today. But back then, in the early 90s, I mean, they were, some of them were in their early 20s and they were activists and they never thought that would, they would get involved in politics. And I found that very inspiring and actually exciting. You know, the way they came to politics was working with the community and like one thing leading to another and then ending up in, in you know, uh, uh, positions of bigger responsibility. But having, you know, the background and the experience to, you know, continue acting and be voices to the community. So, I mean, that's, that for me is a sign of hope, you know, that, I mean, there's still much that we can do and, and that politics start in the ground with your own people and with your family. You know? Thank you very much, Omar, Jose. It was a pleasure chatting with you. And uh, we will uh, definitely watch it again. And I will uh, ask everybody in my network to watch your film. And uh, I'm going to display all the details on the screen. And uh, best of luck to you and uh, your uh, producers. And I hope 
uh, this goes well and your uh, good luck for your next projects too thank you very much thank no, you yeah no. likewise likewise uh, with your projects and thank you for uh, inviting us and your interest in, in the film uh, it's it's really important to to get to as as much people as possible and getting to your specific audience will be important because we have uh, lots of things in common uh, coming from different different countries and being in in the US is, is an experience that connect us all and and we can we can uh, participate in change uh, the world for a for a better place for everybody you know? absolutely for everyone. like i said it's less about nationality more about humanity mm -hmm. all right Sorry. thank you very much guys it thank was you. a pleasure chatting with you So California has made tremendous progress over the last 25 years, but we still got a lot to do. We should be very aware of the shortcomings that we've got. The Latino community in particular, as president and general counsel of MALDEF today, I know that our Latino community does not have the representation that it should have in leadership in the corporate sector, in the higher education sector, in the media sector. So we have challenges not just for those of us in California today, but for those throughout the nation who are facing unprecedented levels of fear inspired by anti-immigrant lies and rhetoric. In terms of the national landscape, unfortunately, Prop 187 became the blueprint for um, really horrendous um, anti-Latino policy. On this vote, the yeas were 239, the nays were 182. The bill is agreed to. The bill is passed without objection. Hoy continuaron las manifestaciones en contra de la HR 4437. In downtown Los Angeles, Latino immigrants marching shoulder to shoulder. It was known as La Gran Marcha, the Great March. More action is expected to come across the country as the bill is debated in Congress. The sun is hot in Arizona, all week pushed and pulled by opponents and supporters of the toughest anti-illegal immigration law in the country. The law passed with unanimous support from Republican legislators. It represents what's best for Arizona. Enough is enough. Alabama's tough new immigration law went into effect today. I'll do anything short of shooting them because illegal aliens need to quit taking jobs for American citizens. Governor Robert Bentley promises enforcement will begin right away. It is a tough bill. It is the toughest bill in the country, but we wanted a tough bill. The legal case against 187 has established the basis for challenging so many anti-immigrant laws throughout the 25 years since then. So it was important to prevent 187 from being replicated in other states. We are in a very unromantic movement in American history. Racism, anti-immigrant hysteria, nativism is just at a high level, one of its highest levels. It's offensive, it's obscene. 15 to 20 people were killed in a mass shooting in El Paso. The shooter describes himself as a white nationalist. Expressing anti-immigration views. This was a hate crime.